Eli Lilly taking a breather today after a scorching two-day rally. The stock up more than 14 percent in the past week. And that's after hiking full-year guidance on demand for its weight loss drugs. Deutsche Bank upgrading that stock to buy this morning, calling it a, quote, low beta, high growth unicorn. Joining me now with her outlook on the stock in the broader biopharma space is Stempoint Capital's Michelle Ross. Welcome back. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, what, what, what is our big takeaway from GLPs? Uh, uh, last week, whether it's Novo or, or Lilly? Yeah, so I think Novo set the stage, and I think it caused a little bit of concern in the midst of what is a tremendous growth market in anticipation of this growth to what is the pricing dynamic uh, on these specific drugs in this class of drug. And that was a fair question. I think as you bring in more uh, exposure to patients, when you include Medicaid coverage and Medicare coverage, you are talking about potentially different price points. However, when Lilly came out and discussed their view of the market, what they are seeing currently, I think they really did dispel any major fear that we were going into uh, really a reversion to, to pushing on price. Um, you actually had uh, Dave Ricks, uh, the CEO of Lilly, mm -hmm. on, the, on the show after their earnings, and he defined this as maybe late in the first inning in terms of the growth dynamic. They are not promoting this. There are many different options and optionalities of how they can grow this product going forward. Okay, so you're as bullish today as you have been it sounds like about GLP ones. I believe that the GLP one class has multitude of additional areas that they can keep moving into, and we're going to see that card turn on more indications and more potential areas for uh, expansion going forward. Yes. Okay. What about healthcare a a as a space by itself? It's sort of it's in the lower part of the middle of the pack, if, yeah. if you will, right? Yeah. It hasn't had a bad year. No. But when you look at 9.3% year to date versus some of these other sectors, it just doesn't really excite you. Yeah. Is that going to change? There's a little bit of an identity crisis in healthcare broadly. If we are talking about the pharmaceutical complex, especially in weeks like we had last week, I think there's an element of the defense, the defensive nature of those companies that really stands out and stands true. And you saw that during a very volatile week, in fact, and the liquidity, the cash flow parameters around those companies. And then on the flip side, you have something near and dear to my heart, which is Smidcap Biotech. Okay. And it is almost the poster child of what we are seeing when we talk about the small caps. You were speaking to the guests earlier about that front. The volatility that you expect to see from the small cap universe is going to be just that, and then add in the idea of the volatility of clinical trials and catalysts. And that's what Smidcap Biotech has offered this year. So extreme growth potential with large amount of volatility, and then the defensive characteristics and nature of large cap pharma have been you know, the, the, the barbell effect we're seeing right now. Where do interest rates come yeah. into this conversation, yeah. if at all, when you're talking about enormous sums of money mm -hmm. um, that are being bet on, on these yes. drugs eventually coming to market? Theoretically, you're going to have to borrow uh, money at, at some point yeah. at what was high rates. Does that play into this picture? Absolutely. And I think one of the issues for biotech over the last number of years has been how it is the poster child for that long duration asset. Biotech typically is raising money consistently from the equity capital markets and investors to fund these trials. They are long term. It's not a fast uh, adoption to be able to bring something to market. It can take upwards of five to 10 years. So when you do talk about the correlation of the XBI, the biotech ETF, mm -hmm. to the rates markets, it is, it is real, it's an inverse correlation. And what we have seen historically in prior periods and what many are expecting going forward is that when rates start being cut, you will see a tailwind to the biotech sector. How active have you been of late in the space? Um, are you an active you know, looker for names, Always. a buyer? What's, the, what's Give me a name from the, one of the most recent purchases that you've made. Yeah. So one name that's relatively new, I would say, in the last couple of quarters uh, is based on a large theme that we've been following. And it really is a cornerstone of biotech is the regulatory environment. And the regulatory environment in biotech is very much predicated on the FDA. And when you see major changes or uh, ways that the FDA is streamlining the ability to bring a drug to market, you take notice. If there's new people at the helm, if there's new approaches to create uh, pilot programs. And we saw that in the rare disease and orphan disease category. These are diseases that usually affect less than 200,000 patients. The ultra orphan can be less than 20, 15 or 20,000 patients in the U.S. And the question is, how do you bring drugs to that market. It's a very small market. One such company that's doing something uh, in this space is called Applied Therapeutics. 
APLT. And they may be a very large beneficiary of some of these changes that are occurring. They are going in front of the FDA over the next couple of quarters with two different programs in the rare disease field. And it is incredibly volatile. It will have a lot of binary uh, outcomes here going forward, but that's something that has definitely caught our attention for the potential outcome for patients here as well. Okay. Uh, a name Syndax I yes. have on my list. Is that something you've owned for a while? It, we have owned it for some time. Uh, it is one that I absolutely believe is going to see some major inflection this year on the back of their two late stage programs. And they are also going in front of the FDA uh, regarding two different drugs in the oncology space. Uh, one is for pediatric AML, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, they are set to get a decision before year end on that front and graft versus host disease. Uh, this is a company that we believe has the potential for multi-billion dollar peak sales of these two products. And again, very importantly, the demand and the necessity is there for patients. So you still we're excited own, about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh. You still own Maris? I do. Yeah. I do. Still as opt optimistic about this still name? Still as optimistic as ever. Um, They're going to have additional data in the head and neck cancer space going into the end of the year. Uh, again, the platform that Miris has, not only do we believe that what they showed in their trial in head and neck cancer was a success, but we believe there was a validation effect to the platform they have in oncology in bi-specifics. So very, very excited about what they're doing there. Thanks for coming uh, by and visiting Absolutely. with us again. We'll see you soon.